the series that I promised you, which um, will try to discuss the basic theory, as well as um, the Chepatara density theorem, and perhaps the future of class field theory. That's the goal of this particular talk. Um, <clears throat> now, in discussing Arcanel series, we need to discuss um, basic character theory. I'm hoping <clears throat> that uh, most of you have uh, seen some basic character theory at some stage in life, um, but I can offer you some basic uh, elementary references. I mean, uh, these references are readable references. I'm not going to give you a tome to kind of go and consult. There are tomes to consult, but you can, you don't, I'm not going to be that cruel. Um, I think the basic, most basic treatment of character theory that I can uh, think of is Sayre's book, Linear Representations of Finite Groups. It's a small book. <clears throat> book. Uh, apparently Sayre had written it um, for um, his wife who was a chemist and she needed um, some basic theory um, to teach her students. So he wrote that book with, uh, with that view in mind and so it's rather accessible. Uh, the whole book is not necessary for you to study. Chapters 1 to 11 would be more than enough for what I'm going to say. And if you don't have access to Sayre's book, um, Lang's Algebra, Lang, Algebra, chapter 18 of that book is also sufficient. So these are both readable. And if you've never seen character theory before in life, um, Perhaps it's not a bad idea to sit with one of these things for about a month and just run through the uh, things and exercises and uh, train yourself. So let me, I'll, I'll give you a basic review of character theory right now so that um, we have some reference point. So let, <clears throat> let G be a group doesn't have to be a finite group at this point. Um, and, okay, let's, well, let's make it a finite group. Simplify life. Let G be a finite group. <clears throat> and, actually, uh, maybe, maybe I want to be a little bit more general. Let's just see. Not a bad idea to be, I mean, you don't have to be so precise at this point. Let G be a group. And let B be a vector space. basically how one way of thinking of representations. Groups acting on vector spaces are representations. And <clears throat> sometimes we, um, we can also write this as um, uh, sometimes, sometimes this is 
dimensional and we choose a basis you know that isomorphisms of V into itself are invertible matrices n by n matrices and, and, and as a dimension so think of it in that way so in other words we think of for each G we have some linear transformation rho of G of V into V so the action of G <coughs> on the vector v is then simply the, the multiplication rho of g acting on v or transforming the vector. <coughs> Thus, the action is the action of g on v is <coughs> tantamount to saying uh, rho, you know, Give, give, it, it is tantamount to saying, uh, is tantamount to saying, given G and G and V and V, G acting on V is just simply rho of G as a, as a linear transformation acting on vector V. Okay. So now both points of view, a group acting on a vector space or a map G going into GLV. These points, both, both points of view are uh, useful in, in uh, our uh, thought process. Okay. <clears throat> so this is general, completely general. We say, we say that the representation V. Uh, now here, we should keep in mind that when I write V, I'm not talking about the vector space V, I'm talking about the vector space V with the G action. So it's essentially a different category, okay? We're not in the category of representation. Uh, we're not in the category of vector spaces, we're in the category of G representations. So representation V together with the G action. Then um, I told you that we can think of these things as n by n invertible matrices. And so uh, we can talk about the, tr the character chi of G is then defined as the trace of the linear transformation rho of G. A trace of rho of G uh, is um, independent of the choice of basis. It's, it's a linear transformation. So it, it, the trace is, um, if I have two different bases, as you know, the matrix representations become conjugate, therefore the trace is well-defined, so this is what we have. And it turns out that we 
um, two representations <coughs> are isomorphic if and only if their characters are true. So it's a basic theorem. Two, now I've, I've moved to the finite dimensional case. Two representations are isomorphic. That's a representation, of course. Uh, if and only if their characters are equal. Now, every representation, this is a beautiful unique factorization theorem, every representation of a finite group can be decomposed as a direct sum of irreducible representations. Maybe I should call basic theorem. Number one, number two, every representation can be decomposed sum of irreducible representations, and this is essentially unique in the sense of the, of the order, unique of the order, essentially unique, let me just say, essentially unique. Now, if we um, if we take a look at okay, maybe I keep this. so is it okay if I move over there? Okay. Um, now, if <coughs> I'll try to write it okay, from this side, uh, if um, classes uh, a function which is constant a function of on G which is constant on the conjugacy classes that it only depends on the class it belongs to it's called a class function so C of X is the space of class function from G to G, which only depend on the class it belongs to, not on the particular element. So it's the same for all the elements of the conscious. These are called class functions. And so we can define again by um, the same, uh, I guess, the same definition for uh, either product with the same G, same thing, 
for the class functions as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll, by abuse of notation, I will, even though I'm in two different vector spaces here, one vector space here, another vector space here, I'll still use the same inner product. So it won't be, so we can, as before, given two class functions, f1, f2, we set the inner product f1, f2, to be 1 over the order of g, it's not the number of elements in the continuity class or anything like that, it's still the same thing. It just happens to be like so. Now, as I said, every representation can be decomposed as a direct sum of irreducible representations, and representations are essentially determined by their characters, we see that every character, which is given a representation as a character, every character can be written as a direct, uh, as, a, as a sum of irreducible characters. So by every, every character can be written as a sum irreducible characters. I should have told you that the first, first point is the number of irreducible characters, um, well, you could, you could see it from the statement that I've been making here, that um, essentially a character is a class function, firstly, point number one. Point number two, we have uh, the number of conjugacy classes is finite, and so if I want to tell you, uh, if I look at a, the function which is 1 on a particular conjugacy class and 0 elsewhere, that gives you a basis for the space of class functions. And every character is um, a linear combination, you know, it is an element of these class functions. Therefore, uh, we, we can write every, uh, there's a finite, you know, the, the finite basis for this thing. So everything is finite. The finite number of irreducible characters. The number of irreducible characters actually is equal to the number of conjugacy classes because the dimension of the space is equal to the number of conjugacy classes. So the number, the cardinality of the set of irreducible characters, um, so this is the set of irreducible characters of G. And the number of such irreducible characters is exactly the number of conjugacy classes. So this is all basic theory, which you can find either in Lang or or, or Sayer. Very beautiful stuff, actually. Uh, and you can see, uh, comparing it with my earlier lectures on. Um, the development of prime number theory, how Dirichlet was led to basic character theory in the case of uh, co-prime residue classes modulo Q, and how uh, many people um, struggle to figure out what the generalization is for arbitrary finite groups. I mean, this is all beautiful evolution of ideas. I'm trying to compress uh, about half a century of thought into, into uh, 15 minutes or so. So this is what we have. And then um, we have uh, the orthogonality relations, the basic orthogonality relations. So those of you who are familiar with um, Dirichlet's theorem on primes and progressions, you know that there, that was essentially the main idea that Dirichlet supplied in order to get his whole thing going. Uh, these were two orthogonality relations. One is the orthogonality of characters, and the other is somehow what's happening with the, with the groups. So orthogonality relations. Uh, number one, if chi and psi are irreducible characters of G, then uh, the inner product chi psi equals one if chi equals psi, and zero otherwise. So this is the first orthogonality relation. The second orthogonality relation is if 
C is a conjugacy class. And G sub C is an element of this class. Then mod C divided by mod G, summation chi bar of G C, chi of G, where I sum over all the irreducible characters. So this is chi of the irreducible characters of G. This combination is equal to 1 if G is in the class and 0 otherwise. So this is the other dual relation that filters out you know, when, when an element is uh, in the class and it's not. So this is what we have. All right. Um, we should know that. We've seen it before somewhere in life. Now, we'll need a couple more other ideas, and that is um, the notion of an induced character. Now, again, the uh, whole subject of representation theory can be taught either from the theory uh, of uh, character point of view, or it can be taught from the point of view of modules, representation modules. Now, both points of view are useful. But for now, I'm going to focus on the character theory point of view because that's what comes up very naturally in the theory of art and else. But both points of view are useful. Uh, so I'm going to give you a definition of an induced character, which might be strange if you're seeing it for the first time, uh, and it is to some extent. Uh, but if, if you were thinking of this in terms of modules, you know, like you have G acting on V, so it's kind of like a V is a G module. Z of G module, and so uh, if you had a subgroup, you know, can I, you know, take that and I had an action of the subgroup on the vector space V, can I now push it to an action of G on the vector space? And so that from the from the uh, module perspective, the notion of an induced representation is very natural. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, and when you work all this out, it'll work out to what I'm going to say right now anyway. But uh, this is also equally clean. If H is a subgroup of G, um, and Psi is an irreducible character of H, okay, then I'm going to define induction from H to G of Psi is going to be a character. So how are we going to define this? This will be defined as X here equals summation Psi dot GI inverse X GI where, so I have to explain some of these things, where the GIs are the cosec representatives of H in G. Okay, so that explains the GIs. And psi, which is an irreducible character H, I want to now extend the definition of psi to G, and I just extend it in a stupid way, saying psi of uh, an element G is going to be zero if G is not an H. So psi dot of G equals psi of G if G is an H and zero otherwise. So this is the, it's the kind of stupid extension of psi to, as a function on, on the group. So we extend this function to the full group and then take this definition. As I said, this when you meet this definition as an induced character, it seems extremely unnatural. And you wonder why you would do this. But if, if you think in terms of the representation modules, you can see how to naturally extend the representation of a subgroup on a vector space, and you want to extend it now to an action of, gee, you know you're going to do it through these cosine representatives. So I'll leave that for you. 
refer to Thier or Lang and, and get that sort of note. So you have this interesting uh, fact. So it turns out that if you give me a character psi on H and I take the induction, it turns out to be a character on G. It may not be an irreducible character, but it'll be a character. What is a character? Character is a sum of irreducible characters. Okay. Linear combinations of uh, positive focus. It's not a virtual character. It's actually it's a proper character. Virtual character means uh, integer linear combinations, where it could be negative or something. Now, um, we have what's called the Frobenius reciprocity law. Unlike Artin reciprocity, this is actually a trivial fact to prove. And it basically says, if you give me a character chi on the group G, and you want to take the inner product of the induction, like so. So I have a character psi on H, and I take the induction, and I look at the inner product. This inner product is the same as chi restricted to H psi. Now keep in mind that I'm writing inner products in two different groups. This left inner product is an inner product in G, and the right inner product is an inner product in H. Okay. I don't want to put subscripts because it will mess, mess up the notation. And this is one of the reasons why you would normalize these things in this fashion so that you get these nice, neat little formulas. If you didn't, if you didn't put this 1 over G as a normalizing factor, these formulas wouldn't be so neat. And you'll be dividing by indices. And it gets messy. It's almost like this 1 over root 2 pi of the theory of Fourier transforms. Why do you, why do you put that in? So that you can get neat formulas, right? So you have to, this is uh, what's a very simple exercise. Uh, you can prove it uh, yourself uh, once you have the basic tree in place. OK, so I think I have. I have enough now to, um, enough to, at least a basic background, to discuss um, Artinel series in this context. Now, a famous theorem of Brouwer was, um, it's a famous theorem in group theory, but actually was motivated by the problem of Artinel series. And that is that every character, oh, so let, let G be a finite group. And let chi be an irreducible group. Then there exists. Integers AI subgroups, um, nil potent subgroups HI and one dimensional characters of HI, psi i. By linearity, you get it for every character. Every character of G can be written as an integer linear combination. So these are integers. Integer linear combination of inductions from HI to G of psi i, where psi i are one dimensional characters. Okay? Now, um, <clears throat> contrary to um, public opinion, um, I don't know, I mean, it's a limited public anyway. Contrary to public opinion, uh, you actually don't need Brouwer's theorem to uh, discuss um, to discuss the Chebotar density. 
remember that Chebotara had proved it in 1926. He did it in other ways, but modern treatments of the Chebotara density theorem have a tendency to use Brouwer's theorem. Um, and it's really not necessary, but I'm going to put it here anyway. I'm going to come up with a slightly uh, weaker version, which is called Arden's theorem, which says I can do this um, with AI's rational numbers. Okay, so so let, let me try to prove that. Uh, so there's a slightly simpler theorem called Arden's theorem, ML Arden, uh, saying that, so here's, here's the theorem. If G is a finite group, Um, and chi is an irreducible character. Then there exist rational numbers, AI, cyclic subgroups, HI. And of course, one dimensional characters uh, psi i of hi such that chi is a rational linear combination of induction from hi to g. except that the AIs are allowed to be rational numbers. And why is it so, it, why is it easier to prove this and not so easy? Well, there's a little bit of, you read Sayer's thing, you'll see that there's a little bit of intricacy involved. And that's why it took about a bit of time to do that. But as I said, it's, it's accessible. So I want to give a linear algebra proof of this fact. So what we'll do is, um, now, this proof is actually not mine. Uh, it's due to Foot and Kumar. I got the idea there. I've simplified it a little bit um, so that it's a, uh, you don't need so much. Uh, I think I've cleaned up a little bit of their notation. Um, and the idea is very simple. For each subgroup cage, For each subgroup H and each character psi, we take the induction. So I told you before that that's a, a nice character of the group. And so I can write it as a linear combination of irreducible characters. How do, you, how do you calculate the coefficient? Well, the inner product, because of the orthogonality relations, it's the inner product of H, uh, induction H, G to H uh, to psi of um, G, comma, chi, chi. Right? Summation is over the irreducible characters. So we can write this in this fashion. We call this star. Now here's a loaded word. Consider, actually it's very cute. Consider the vector a chi. So for each chi, consider for each chi the irreducible character. The vector a chi, which is just simply the bunch of these numbers. So for each, so I'm just fixing an order of all the, uh, all the cyclic subgroups, so these are going to be cyclic induction H to G, psi, uh, comma, chi, as I run over H cyclic and psi, so just fix some listing of all the cyclic subgroups, and for each cyclic subgroup, fix some listing of 
all the irreducible characters and just write these numbers down. Okay, so I get a, a big long vector. Okay, for each I get a row vector. For each chi I get a row vector. Okay, now so one for each chi. I claim that these row vectors are linearly independent. A chi are linearly independent over Q. Why? Well, let's see. Suppose not. Good way to begin, right? Suppose not. So suppose that zero equals summation lambda chi. A chi for some for some numbers lambda chi rational. Suppose this happens. Okay. Then what? Then um, we see that if that happens, then all you do is put this in there. Okay. So 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 that means summation. Um, chi, lambda chi, times this induction h to g of psi, comma chi, um, equals zero for all h and all psi, right? For all h cyclic and all psi, the original one-dimensional characters of each, each, each component, right? Okay. So now I can put this lambda chi in here. By linearity of this inner product, this is the case. See. Right. Now, do not apply for Venus reciprocity, okay? <laughs> not yet. Call this guy phi. So this is a legitimate class function. This is a linear combination of characters, so it's a legitimate class function. What is this saying? This is saying that the <coughs> phi inner product with the induction of this thing is zero for every h of psi, which means now apply for Venus reciprocity, which says psi phi restricted to h is zero. This guy is zero. So here I have a, a, a function phi, a class function phi, Restricted to every subgroup H, every cyclic subgroup, every character side zero. So it's zero on every cyclic subgroup. Therefore, it's zero, period. So this implies phi is identically zero. If phi is identically zero, then now I apply orthogonality relations. Phi is identically zero. What is the coefficient lambda chi? It's the inner product of Phi with chi. Which is zero. Therefore, lambda chi is zero. Okay, so there that means that these are linearly independent. Okay, so I have these huge row vectors, and I've just shown you all these row vectors are linearly independent. Therefore, if I write this huge, humongous matrix, which each row vector is one of these things, I write how many rows do I have? As many character, irreducible characters. Therefore, the rank of this matrix is the rank, rank. The rank of this matrix is the number of irreducible characters, which is the, the you know, I just proved this. column rank is row rank, right? So therefore, I should choose. I, I can choose a bunch of columns. The number of columns being the number of irreducible characters from here, which sides of this matrix is, is invertible. Okay, so let me just kind of keep this and move here. Plus the matrix. Characters 
has rank. Has rank uh, equal to the number of units of characters. Okay, so we've shown that the rows are linearly independent. So the row rank is this, which is that's row rank. Therefore, the column rank is the same. In other words, I can pick cyclic subgroups HI, one dimensional character psi, such that I've got that many, right? So there exist HI, psi i, such that the matrix given by induction HI, G, psi i, chi. So I'm running over the HIs and psi i's on one hand, that's giving me the columns, and the rows are being parameterized by the chi's. This matrix, so as chi runs over the units of characters of G, and the HIs are, and psi i's are running over the very appropriate things, you end up getting, you end up getting, that matrix is invertible, is invertible. So that particular matrix is invertible. Now, look at this equation star with these H arms. Thus, from star, what do we have? Induction H i to G psi i equals equals induction H i to G psi i chi times chi, right? That's where chi is running over the irreducible characters of G. Now think of this as a matrix equation. I have how many elements here? As many as the number of irreducible characters. So I have a column vector here corresponding to the number of irreducible characters equals this particular matrix times the column vector of all the irreducible characters on that side. I just told you that that matrix is invertible. Therefore, I can solve for chi, right? Solve for chi. Since the matrix is invertible. Keeping in mind, by the way, I told you that chi is an irreducible character, psi is an irreducible character, induction of hi to g, this is the multiplicity of the character chi in this thing. It's a multiplicity, it's a representation, it's positive, not, at least non negative, okay? And therefore, these are all into positive, non negative integers. So when I invert, I might get a rational matrix. Chi can be written as some integer expression, H i, G, psi i, T i, expression. So you see this, this weaker version of Brouwer's theorem where A i's are allowed to be rational numbers as opposed to integers is much easier to prove. And nothing but linear algebra. Uh, modulo the orthogonality relations and the understanding of the induced representation. Yeah. Where did we use cyclic? We used, we didn't use cyclic. You see, I, we, I used cyclic in this, I just parametrized everything like this. We didn't use cyclic. This, that's, that's a good question that you asked. It means that there might be some room, as long as, you know, cyclic is in the following sense. If I want to, if I want to say here that phi is identically zero, I want to show phi evaluated at some point, g, is equal to zero, right? Well, I can look at the group generated by g, and phi on that cyclic group generated by g is therefore zero. That's where I'm using it. But you could replace this with a family of groups that kind of covers g. That's the point. See, all cyclic groups cover g, right? You take any element, you take the group generated by that. So all a family of cyclic groups cover g. So there is a little bit of freedom here. You can replace them with other groups where you, where you have, um, as long as the whole group is covered by it. OK, that's a good point. But we are, that's where we use it. Because I want to say phi is identically 0 it means that phi restricted to any cyclic group is 0. So OK, this is how you get this. It's a very beautiful 
result. And as I said, it's not this idea is not really mine. This is Dudu Kumar and uh, Richard Foote. And uh, but it, it uh, I think I've made it slightly elegant. Their argument. It's not uh, okay. Now, now we have this uh, background. We can discuss art and art series. downstairs can be used to generate an ideal upstairs and by Dedekind's theorem this ideal factors as a product of prime ideals uniquely like so and as I, I mentioned this before that essentially um, all these EIs are equal to 1 unless P ramifies so apart from a finite collection of primes this is really a product of distinct uh, prime ideals. And for each prime ideal, we have what's called a decomposition group, a collection of elements in the Galois group that fix the prime ideals. Let's call it decomposition. See, the Galois group is acting on the prime ideals, uh, on the prime ideals both prime, fixed prime downstairs, and look at all the prime ideals upstairs, it's acting on the set. Because if I apply sigma to the left hand side, it's stable because it's in the base field, and it has to permute them because of Dedekind's theorem and unique factorization, so it's acting on the thing, okay? So a little bit of thought will give you this. Then there's what's called the inertia group, collection of automorphisms, such that sigma of x congruent to x modulo pi for all x in the ring of integers of the top field. Okay. Moment's reflection shows that i sub pi is a subgroup of the decomposition group. Also, it's a normal subgroup. One has a theorem, which I'm not going to prove right now, but to show that the if you look at the ring of integers of capital K modulo this prime ideal pi, this is a finite field, as you know, right? Prime ideal. Uh, prime ideals are also maximal ideals, that's a field, right? Finite field. And if I, I can look at this as an extension of this finite field. This finite field, the canonical fashion, and the Galois group of this finite extension of finite fields is isomorphic to the decomposition group modulo, sorry, modulo uh, the inertia. Now we know something already about these finite field extensions. We know by Fermat's little theorem or thereabouts that the map that takes x to x to the norm p is the automorphism called the Frobenius automorphism. Is the, it's a, this is a cyclic group, the Galois group. The Galois group is a cyclic group, this is a cyclic extension, and it's generated by this Frobenius automorphism. 
therefore, using that canonical thing, there's a map, there's an element in this in this uh, group, the decomposition group, such that um, you have modulo pi. So the effect of the this is true for all x in the ring of integers of the top guy. So the effect of the automorphism, remember the automorphism is acting on the field. So the effect of this acting on a field element is the same, is modulo pi is the same as x to the norm p. This is, there's a unique such element, unique up to inertia. And I told you inertia is essentially trivial up to, apart from a finite number of primary. So you can, for the purpose of this talk, essentially ignore the inertia. This is called the Frobenius automorphism as well. So this is Frobenius, sometimes called the Frobenius symbol. Now, so I've defined the Frobenius symbol for each of the prime ideals that are upstairs uh, above, so above this fixed P. So as I move around the prime ideal script PI upstairs, these decomposition groups become conjugate. And therefore, these sigma PIs are conjugate. So they determine a conjugacy class. So the conjugacy class determined by those automorphisms is called the Artin symbol. Sigma sub, sigma sub P is the Artin symbol. And it is defined as the conjugacy class of sigma p or p dividing p. And as I said, it's well defined modular inertia. We'll worry about that a little later, later on, but for the time being, let's ignore that issue. So this is a, a conjugacy class. So this is what's called the Artin symbol. Now I think I have enough um, data to define the Artin L symbol. So let rho be a, a representation of G. We will define the Artin L series attached to, to rho. It's a function of S. And of course, it's determined by this extension, the Galois extension, capital K over rho K, is equal to an Euler product over all the prime ideals P, determinant of the identity matrix minus rho of sigma P, norm P minus S, acting on the vector space, the characteristic polynomial acting on the vector space fixed by the inertia inverse. So let me try to explain all these. For each prime ideal P, you pick a prime ideal script P upstairs. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Pick any one. Take the Frobenius element. This characteristic polynomial depends only on the class of this thing. It doesn't depend on the, it's, it, the element itself. You take norm P to the minus S, and it's, it's, used, it's thought of as a linear transformation acting on this vector space. It's a characteristic polynomial of this linear transformation acting on the vector space fixed by inertia. Now, I told you the inertia is trivial for the most part. So this is just V, so it's no big deal. But if it's not um, trivial, you look at the subspace fixed by the inertia, then sigma P is well defined. I told you it's defined modulo inertia. But now if inertia is stable, it doesn't matter what I, which one I pick. So, so this is a well defined object. And if you think a little bit about it, you'll see that because we're in a finite group, the eigenvalues of this particular thing, because it's a finite group, all the eigenvalues will be roots of unity. And therefore, the spoiler product converges absolutely uh, for real part S, strictly bigger than one. So there's this famous conjecture of Artin, Artin's conjecture.
if rho is irreducible, if rho is irreducible and not trivial, then LS rho capital K extends to an entire function. Now, the uh, motivation for this conjecture is uh, manifold. Um, strongest perhaps comes from the situation with um, uh, Dirichlet characters for on the one hand and Hecke characters which uh, Arden already knew about. Uh, so these ideal class zeta functions and so on and so forth that we already discussed. So in those cases um, this is correct and so in fact Arden proved um, is that if rho is one dimensional, then this is true, this is true. If rho is one dimensional, then this is true. So this is Arden's uh, theorem. Uh, it's a tough time sometimes this is also called Arden reciprocity. Reciprocity law that we discussed is essentially uh, what's involved here. And uh, in the last uh, 30 years or so, um, maybe 20 years, 20, 20, 30 years, substantial progress has been made. Uh, one could also say, by the way, that the Langlands program's uh, uh, motivation for the Langlands program is uh, partially due to the art of conjecture, trying to figure out how to prove this. So uh, if you've heard the word Langland's program before, then um, it makes sense to think of uh, this as a motivating problem of that program. Um, then we have um, theorem due to Langland's tunnel, Kare, uh, Interpreting. I'm combining all their works. I'm not saying that they did a joint work, okay, but they, they, they did some, in some sense, in an abstract sense, they did joint work. <laughs> but, all right, but what they proved is that uh, the conjecture is also true for uh, two dimensional odd. Galois representations. Is that correct? Over Q. Over Q, correct. Okay. Representations over Q. In other words, uh, the base field has to be Q. Uh, although, uh, part of Langland's uh, tunnel thing, I think, is over arbitrary uh, part. So, okay, so. Um, yeah, but let me just say it like this. This is good enough for, for the time being. And there's some more. So the Langlands tunnel part is actually true over arbitrary fields. All right. Now, it was this conjecture of Arden that motivated Brouwer to try to um, prove his uh, theorem. So let me just indicate. Brouwer's theorem implies viromorphic continuation. And um, to, for this purpose, you need some factorial properties of the Art Nell series, which I'm going to review. I'm not going to prove it. It's actually these. These functorial properties are not hard to prove, um, especially one key property that I need. Um, all of them are basic exercises. Uh, there's one, which is kind of a um, So 
the basic properties of R and L series. So one is if chi equals chi one plus chi two as characters. Um, oh, I should point out. Okay, so let me just go back here. Um, just say the following thing. There's some abuse of notation that will take place. So here, rho is a representation. Ls rho capital K over little k is what we have defined it as. But sometimes it may be convenient to write it as Ls chi k over capital k. Okay, so I'll do that. I'll just have a little bit of sloppy notation. If chi equals chi 1 plus chi 2, then Ls chi um, capital K little k then this is the product of Ls chi 1 capital K little k Ls Two characters. So this point number one, some sort of additivity property for characters, uh, translating to multiplicative property of alpha functions. Second, if um, H is a subgroup of G and psi is an irreducible character. So what we let's have a look at the picture. K, uh, K is here. Uh, let's look at the subfield fixed by H. So we have this extension. So we have a Galois extension here with Galois group H, right? And we have a Galois extension here with Galois group G. I'm not saying this H is normal. I'm not saying that. Okay. So H is just a subgroup. So now, if I take an irreducible character on one hand, according to uh, the recipe, I mean the recipe, recipe of Arden, we have the character attached to psi corresponding to this relative extension. So psi is an irreducible character here in this relative extension. And so I can consider the Arden L function attached to psi for that particular relative extension. Well, this turns out to be the same as the Arden L function attached to the induced character from H to G of psi capital K. So in other words, if I take my character psi and induce it to G and now view it as a character of G, the elf art null function attached to that is the same. Now this is not terribly difficult to prove. There are only two things going on here. One is you need to know what a what a induced character is, point number one. Point number two, you need to know how did you build up the uh, Euler factor. You built, built it out of one of these prime ideals. So what you need to study is how does the factorization of a prime ideal move as you move up the fields. That's all. And that's very elementary algebra. So I'll let you think about that. Now ha having these two facts in place, we have Robert's theorem. Property one, so using one, 
we see that the arc null function attached to chi corresponding to the field extension capital K over little k can be written as a product of arc null functions attached to these characters hi to g of psi i capital K over little k to the power of a i since this is a product over Happy with this? All right. And now we use property number two, which tells me that the induced character can be uh, changed to this, where psi i is one dimensional. And this is a Galois extension with Galois group HI. I told you that Artin proved his Artin reciprocity law tells you that these one dimensional things are entire. LS psi i k over k h i is entire. But unfortunately, this a i is an integer. So it could be a positive integer or a negative integer. So we don't get analytic continuation as an entire function, we get it as a mirror-morphic function. So since the, so by art and reciprocity, LS psi i, k over khi, is entire. And therefore, each of these objects here is an entire function, but the ai could be a positive or a negative integer, therefore you have a quotient of entire functions, and that's why it's mirror -morphic. This also signals the importance of dealing with arbitrary base fields. This is why the car of interpretation thing can't be pushed, but the Landon's tunnel can. And I think that was a very important even uh, while it's proof from a... So you have this now. Um, so this gives you a mirror morphic continuation. Okay. In the 15 minutes remaining, let me just try to show you how to prove um, the Chebotaro density theorem. So this is this is part two art and L series. Part three will be the chapter. And part four, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the future of class field theory. Yeah. Very briefly. state the theorem, what it is. Uh, given capital K over little k with group G, as above or as before, let C be a conjugacy class. And the number of prime ideals was norm, absolute norm. So absolute norm means all the way down to Q of the prime ideal P is less than or equal to X. And the art and symbol, remember I told you the conjugacy class, belongs to that conjugacy class. Is asymptotic to the number of elements in the conjugacy class divided by the number of elements of g times x over log x, as x goes to Now this is not exactly what Chepatara proved. Chepatara proved a, a weaker result uh, um, in terms of densities and so on and so forth. Um, but now uh, I think it's pretty clear that this, uh, this is a standard consequence uh, from the Talberian perspective, which I'm going to uh, talk about. 
which you've already seen in the top area. Machine, as it were, if you want to call it. So let me try to give you a quick rundown of the Tauberian machine. Let um, summation AN, so let FMS be summation N going from infinity 1 to infinity AN over FMS. Um, be a nearest series. So this is, this is part one of the program. Let f of s equals summation an over m to be addition series analytic or be a Dirichlet series. Suppose the Dirichlet series converges, uh, which which converges absolutely. Here, in part one of the Tauberian theorem, we're assuming the, co the coefficients are not equal. In part two of the Tauberian theorem, we assume that they're not necessarily that. Suppose g of x, suppose g of x equals uh, bn over nps. Um, converges absolutely for real S in one. Assume that the absolute so these Bns can be complex numbers, assume that Bn is less than or equal to Bn in part one. That is there exists some series in part one that dominates this series. Assume this. And suppose that GS extends analytically to real part S bigger than or equal to 1. Except perhaps at S equal to one, where it has a simple pole and residue little r 
which could be zero. If it's zero, it means there is no pole, okay? Residue little r. Then, summation n less than x, bn is asymptotic to little r times x as x goes to infinity. So if, f, if r were equal to zero, the way you should interpret this is that the summation bn is little of x. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the top area here. So I'm going to push this down here, okay. And we want to use this in proving the uh, Chebukov density theorem. Now, in order to do that, let me, um, there are several ways of doing it, actually. Let me, let me just insert an exercise, which is an interesting, uh, again, an observation. This exercise is due to uh, essentially Hill, Albert, Stark. Um, and what you do is fix not in the complex plane and define this data g of g to be a virtual character. Virtual character means a integer linear combination of ordinary characters. N chi s not times chi of g or chi uh, runs over the irreducible characters, and n chi s naught is the order of the zero of ls chi. Okay. This is the order of the zero. Now remember, from Brouwer's theorem, this is well defined. Brouwer's theorem tells me the function is mirror-morphic. Therefore, this is a, Arden's conjecture says this is always non-negative and chi is irreducible, right? Uh, but this is an integer. So this is, at, at the moment, it's a virtual character. Then, uh, prove that um, summation n chi s naught squared chi is less than or equal to the order of the Dedekind zeta function of the top field S squared. So this is the dedicated zeta function of the top guy. Okay, so I ask you to prove this exercise and the hint for it's not it's not a trivial exercise. Uh, hint consider see I'm giving you the first line of the proof. <laughs> consider the inner product theta g with itself. Okay, consider that. That would be unfair if I stop there. If you, if you consider that, you see that by orthogonality, you get this guy. And then use Frobenius reciprocity. Frobenius reciprocity along with Arden reciprocity. So the Arden reciprocity is a deep result. Frobenius reciprocity is a very elementary result, but you need to use both. And then when you do that and combine everything together, you get this. Okay. Now we know that the Dedekind zeta function does not vanish on the line real s equals one. And it has a simple pole at s equals one. We know that. Therefore, I mean that's the same proof of the Hadamard dilemma that was Okay. So therefore, if s is not equal to one, but has real part equal to one, this is zero. Therefore, all of these have to be zero. If, yeah, if, 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 um, if S equals one, this is one, there's a simple pole. And there's a trivial character, which also is true. So that one, that takes care of it, everybody else has to be zero. So as a corollary of the exercise, 
L as chi, capital K over little k, is not equal to zero for all chi irreducible in the real part S equals one. So um, now, with this information in place, with this information in place, we um, we want to look at. So remember, I think somewhere, yeah, right here, actually, this great blackboard technique. Good blackboard technique. If C is a conjugacy class and GC is an element in the conjugacy class, I have this way of filtering out elements in the conjugacy class. Chapatar of density theorem is asking me how often does it happen that sigma p is in that class? So clearly, chi bar of GC, chi of sigma p. And I sum over all the characters chi, and I take this mod c over mod g. This equals one if sigma p is in the class and zero otherwise. So I have a way of detecting when something is in a set and something is not in a set. The fundamental metaphor of mathematics: how to, given a set. How do I figure out whether it's in the set or not in the set? Could be very hard. It's the recurrent theme in mathematics, in many, many problems, right? So if you have the eye of the mathematician, you can recognize the, the brilliance and the importance of such sieving techniques. These are, how would you sieve? How would you sift out exactly what you want? So in some sense, everything is some form of sift theory. <laughs> okay, so now, this is the way to dis distinguish when sigma p is in the conjugacy class. I want to count them. But I'm going to count, I'm going to count uh, them with uh, log of norm p. So sigma p is in the class. And then I'm going to count it with this weight. It's a little bit more convenient. Okay. Then what I end up getting, if you if you don't mind, I also include also the prime ideal powers of ideals, and and the powers of ideals like squares, cubes, and so on and so forth are really negligible for the count, but it'll be useful to do this now. And then I'll leave it as an exercise to, for you to show the squares, cubes, and etc. Are going not going to give you much as by way of the main term with respect to the main term. So now you have something like this, and now. Let's plug this guy in. So this is now norm p, the alpha less than x, log norm p. And I have this beautiful way of fi figuring out when sigma p is inside or not. So mod c over mod g, summation chi over the irreducible characters, chi bar of gc, chi of sigma p. So I rewrote the whole thing in this fashion. Because this guy inside is one precisely when sigma p is in C and zero otherwise. Okay. What do we do when we see two sums? We interchange, apply Fubini's theorem. So you get mod c over mod g, summation chi, gc. Inside we get chi of sigma p, log norm p norm p of the alpha is less than x. Now I need to know what's going on here. Okay. Now when chi is the trivial character, separate all. When chi is the trivial character, this is just one. And this is just log norm p, and that's just the usual prime ideal counting function. So when chi is the trivial character, I get mod c over mod g times what's called the psi, the analog of the so-called Chebyshev psi function for the number field. So that's the trivial character. Plus, when chi is not the trivial character, times the sum.
now we recognize that if I look at L prime of S chi, capital K over little k, over L S chi, capital K over little k. So the logarithmic derivative, let's put a minus sign because there's going to be a minus sign in there because the oil product stuff comes in, is actually equal to chi of sigma p log norm p over norm p to the alpha s squared. I'm running over all the p's and the alphas. <coughs> so this is a Dirichlet series. This is a perfectly good Dirichlet series. And uh, just let me just quickly remind you that this guy here was the Dedekind zeta function of the top field. So let me remind you that zeta k prime over zeta k of s was simply the same guy without the character. I hope you can see this, okay? So you get something like norm p of the alpha s. Okay, now um, this series, <coughs> this series it has a, is analytic for real part s bigger than 1, and because of the non-vanishing of the Dedekind zeta function on real s equals 1, is analytic for real s equals 1, except in s equals 1 where it has a simple pole, and therefore you get your main term. So by part 1 of the Tauberian theorem, you know the asymptotic formula for psi k of x. It's x. Part 2 of the Tauberian theorem, tells me that, <coughs> by the way, if I, if I go back to this topic, you don't have to have money, and you could have put a constant in here, okay, that, some C, it does, it's dominated by that, so big O of is good enough, yeah. Then, each of these characters, you see, is bounded by the character degree, which is opposed to the number of degree, the number of people, okay, so you have, you have that, so this is, this satisfies part two of the Tauberian theorem. And therefore, <coughs> by the fact that the Art and L series attached to irreducible characters do not vanish on the line one, there is no pole, there is no pole of this guy on the line real series. Therefore, the residue is zero, and therefore the contribution for all these terms is little of x. Therefore, what we end up getting is that this quantity here is exactly what you call mod c over mod g times x plus little r, small letter, plus little of x. And therefore, uh, that's what we get. Now, if you want to get count without the weight log norm p, that's an exercise in partial summation, and then you can get Chapter density theorem. So this is the uh, proof of the Chapter density theorem. Um, now, there are lots and lots of beautiful applications uh, of this theory, and I'm thinking that because I took already one and a half hours, perhaps the future of class field theory can be relegated to another lecture, where I will also discuss applications of uh, the Chapter density theorem to a variety of problems. Not a good idea to rush things through and cram um, you know, your brains with lots and lots of beautiful stuff then that's uh, counterproductive. So I think, I hope this is enough for this time being, uh, and uh, enough uh, for you to ponder over. A lot of beautiful stuff, right? So the, this is the real reason why Chiawatara density theorem is useful, but the problem with art series is still